I know. People got up early, went over yonder and got your bellies full. Makes you feel a little tired and, and drowsy and that sort of thing. Hard to stay awake, ain't it, Brad? <laughs> <laughs> but you know, no matter how tired we are, and you, you can't deny this, there's something in your life that no matter how tired you are, you can stay awake for it. Amen. Amen. You get excited about it. Mm, yeah. I'm going to tell you something, the Word of God is exciting. Amen. Amen. If you'll let it speak to you, if you'll let it get down into your heart, it's an exciting thing. Mm -hmm. I may not be. Mm -hmm. I might be boring as all get out. Mm -hmm. But don't listen to me, listen to the voice That's of the right. Spirit that Amen. comes Amen. through the Word of God. Right. Let that speak to you. And that's something that, that will give you a fire. Uh, you can feel it in your hands, and you can feel it in your feet, and you can feel it all over you. Right. If you really, if we would understand that it's not this guy up here talking, it's not because he read something in particular. Everybody has scriptures that touches them, has songs that touches them, that means something to them. But if you would just listen to the voice of the Spirit that comes through the Word of God, right. really listen with the ear of the Spirit, there's not a time that you would get into this word that it wouldn't speak to you. Mm -hmm. And you could get excited about it. I, I've got a good bit of scripture. And I'll try to move through it just as quickly as I can, but I'm not going to shortcut whatever God says to say. That's what I'm going to say. Amen. <coughs> uh, there's several points that I want to make. Some of it's a continuation of what we talked about this morning. Some of it goes along with the Sunday school lesson. Uh, I'll try to give it to you the way that God gave it to me and, and you pray and you open up to receive what it is that God has for you out of this. We're going to be beginning in the book of 1 Corinthians in chapter 15. Then we'll break in at the third verse. Christ is raised. 
And this is so crucial to what I'm going to get on to. You must understand and you must believe that everything that you are as a child of God hinges on the resurrection. There were other parts that were necessary and that were needful that had to be done. But the hinge pin is the resurrection. I read it to you here. If he didn't raise, you're in sin. We are justified by his resurrection. And unless we're justified, we cannot see heaven. We cannot have that eternal home. None of this matters if we can't accept the resurrection. <coughs> That's first and foremost. And if that's the case, going on here, then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Now listen, what is the scariest thing to men? It's death. Death is the scariest thing. Uh, you can go back and you can even read in a lot of Solomon's writing. Enjoy the labor of your hands. Eat, drink, and be merry because eventually you're just going to die. There was a very well-known Greek saying, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. Uh, all throughout history you can find, get what you can get now, enjoy what you can enjoy now because you're just going to die. Death is a scary thing. People did everything they could. Uh, uh, it sounds foolish when you stop and think about it, but there were actually people who believed there was a fountain of youth and did everything they could do to find that fountain of youth so that they could live forever. You can turn on your TV today. I was watching it yesterday. You can get creams and ointments and lotions to make you look younger. Uh, you can take these vitamins. You can have this done and you can have that done uh, and it'll make you look and feel younger and you'll get a couple more years out of this old body and you can they're trying everything in order to live forever. And why is that? Because death is a scary thing. It's not scary to a child of God now. But listen, before, before the resurrection, there was no hope. There was no hope. As far as they knew, I'm going to die. I'm going to become worm food. I don't know what's on the other side. Am I going to be trapped in an abyss somewhere? And what's going to happen, I don't know. But it's a very scary thing to step out there into that unknown. If in this life only we have hope, we are of all men and most miserable. All these people who use the creams and the ointments and the lotions and look for the fountain of you and try to come up with this and try to come up with that in order, and they're still trying to do it. They're eventually talking about building a robot where they can take you and put it in that robot so that you can be eternal. I got news for them, it ain't going to work. But that's what we're about. Why? Because death is scary. Because they have no hope. If in this life only they have hope, that's where their hope lies. In the creams, in the ointments, in the fountain of youth, in building some kind of artificial intelligence and making me live forever. That's where their hope lies. And, and because of that, they are miserable. They are scared to death. That's why Paul says, if in this life only we have hope, we are of all men most miserable. And he goes on. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order. Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God. Even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. In the natural sense, unless Christ comes, we're all going to die. But death has already been defeated. But there is coming a day. When he's going to put death down for the final and the last time, you know what the book of Revelation said, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. Those who don't have Christ, they're going to die forever. They're never going to cease dying. They're never going to quit dying. But death will finally be 100% annihilated from existence, from the uh, influence, from any kind of impression on the child of God. Christ is going to put everything under his feet. He's got authority over it all. And it's coming down to that day when we don't have, I, I'm, even, even Christians, you've got to admit, there's a little bit of trepidation mm -hmm. about death. 
because it's unknown. You haven't been there. Nobody went there and come back and told you what it was like. Nobody uh, has gone and sent postcards uh, and all this stuff. So it's built into a human being to be wary of the unknown. And there is that little bit of fear. But this is why we need to really get a hold of the resurrection. We really need to understand the resurrection. If you can get it ingrained in you to that degree that, yes, I know Christ did it. And because Christ did it, he conquered all these saved. And he said, because he lives, I can live. And there should be no fear in that. And I kind of mentioned it this morning. It's a doorway. Exactly. It's just a doorway. That's right. From this existence to an eternal existence. And I know in the mind, the human mind, that's hard to get and it's hard to comprehend. And I want to put this in there. As I said, there's several things in here I want to bring out. When we lose loved ones, it's hard. It's hard. But we need to understand that they were born again. It's just like they walked out that door mm -hmm. into a better place. That's it. Amen. It's hard to let go. It, it, it's hard. And the Bible tells us, really, we should weep when they're born mm -hmm. and rejoice when they pass over. It's hard for us to do that. And I think a lot of it is because it's hard for us to get that reality in us. It's really hard. We know it. We read it. We understand it. We accept it. We believe that Jesus was crucified, that he was buried, and that he rose again, and that because he lives, we can live. But we got to get it down in here so that we know that when, when they go or when we go, it's a joyous thing. It's a good thing. And... There should be no fear. I know I talked most of this this morning, and I did this. God just gave me to recap, but I want to get into something else that God has given me. We're going to go on in that chapter, but we're going to jump to verse 35. What is going to happen? What is going to happen to you? How does this whole thing come about? There's so much. Uh, uh, different opinions and different ideas about how things happen uh, at, when we all die and, and how does this happen when, when I die my soul goes to heaven and, and it's with God but then the Bible says I'm going to come out of the grave how is that going to happen and, and there's so much of that and I'm not going to pretend to stand up here and tell you that I know all this and I'm going to be 100% completely honest with you I don't care I know this what I read in Job I know my Redeemer lives. Amen. And in the last day, He will stand on the earth and I will see Him and I will be with Him. How He chooses to do that, I really don't care. Mm -hmm. and I ain't going to argue about it and I ain't going to fight about it and I ain't going to fuss about it. There are some who believe in soul sleep, that the, that the soul sleeps until resurrection. I don't know. I can find scripture that makes you think that. I can also find scripture that says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But I don't care. Because right. I know where I'm going. Amen. And I'll get there when it's time for me to get there. Mm -hmm. I ain't going to be late. <laughs> <laughs> but I, God led me to this and I, I, and I want to try to bring something out here. How many of you are tired? Mm -hmm. I am. Mm -hmm. How many of you are achy? Mm -hmm. How many of you feel age creeping up on you? <laughs> How many of you got physical issues? Mm -hmm. Everybody in here can answer yes to some of that. All of that. Well, I'm going to tell you something. From the time you drew your first breath, you began to die. That's right. And, and I want you to think about something. We're going into the scripture here. Let me read a little bit of it. Verse 35. But some man will say, How are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Thou fool. That which thou sowest is not quickened, or made alive, made a new life, except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bare grain. It may chance of wheat or of some other grain. But God gives it a body as it hath pleased him in every seed his own body. Paul's using an example of a grain here, but it applies to us. Listen, I want you to think of corn. You take one little kernel of corn, that little tiny yellow kernel of corn, and you put it in the ground. What happens to that kernel of corn? 
It dies. But what comes from it? A brand new creation. Mm -hmm. Nothing like that thing. It's tall and it's green and it's vibrant. And on it, there's coming out more corn. Not just one kernel, but two or three cobs with lots of kernels on each cob. It has been complete. There is a semblance of what was planted. There is a, a part of that there. But besides that, there's something brand new. Something entirely different. And that's what Paul's saying here. He said, that which thou sowest is not quickened or made alive, it brought forth new life, except it die. We're a seed, basically. Inside that kernel of corn is something that I can't explain. And some scientists or biologists or agriculturalists or something might think they can, but I don't think they can explain. How did God stuff that whole great big corn plant <laughs> with all them cobs on it? How did he stuff it in that little thing? You can't explain that. Now listen. He's using grain for an example. How much greater is that stalk and all that than that little grain? How much greater is what you're going to be right. compared to what you are? Amen. We're going to lay this down. Mm -hmm. And we're on that journey. That, that kernel that we planted. Now let's go back. Now here's the stalk. Uh, it's come up and it's got all these cobs on it. It's got these kernels on it. But let's start from the beginning. It starts out very small. Just like you started out as a baby. But it grows and it grows and it grows and eventually it gets big and it brings forth those cobs and it brings forth those kernels and when those cobs come out with the kernels on them at first they're little and they're green and they're soft and slowly they get bigger and a little harder and bigger and a little harder and eventually they start drying out and eventually the whole thing starts to turn brown that's what's happening to us we started out young and vibrant and full of life and strong and we grow and, and we produce to an extent things in this life but eventually we start to dry out. We start to turn brown and we start to get, you know, just like that corn does. And we become like that kernel. That kernel eventually becomes real dry and real hard. And that's when it's ready to be planted. That's when it's ready to go into the ground. Because then it has reached the point of full maturity. It's done what it needs to do in order to be ready to be planted. So that however God stuffed all that stuff in there, he can get it back out. That's how we are. God brings us to a point where we're ready to be as the grain is, as Paul says here. To be sown. And then uh, we will bring forth. That, that God wants for us. He says, but God gives it a body as it has pleased him and to every seed his own body. God has something in particular for each and every one. On that resurrection morning, when that new body comes forth, and however, whatever it happens, I do believe it comes out of the ground because the Bible tells us that the dead in Christ shall rise. So I do believe however God does it, it comes out of the ground. Whether he sends your soul back and puts it in there or your soul was sleeping or whatever happens, doesn't really matter to me. But I believe that it rises up just like that grain when it's planted. It rises up out of the ground and becomes that vibrant thing. That's what we're going to become. That's how it's going to be with us. And then he goes on here. Going to jump down to verse 40, 42. He's talking about the grain, and we go to 42. So is, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. Listen, this is what you've got to look forward to. You're sown in corruption. What is corruption? It's decay. You're decaying. Like I already said, from the moment you drew that first breath, you began to decay. You began on a road, on a journey that was going to end in death. You began to, to 
head for that direction. And it says, though, we are going to be sown in corruption, but raised in incorruption. And we are sown in dishonor, but we're going to be raised in glory. We're going to have glorified bodies. We're going to be a glorified people. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. I'm going to tell you something on this earth, right here, right now. I preached this for a long time, and I believe it from the bottom of my heart. There is power in the Holy Spirit of God. There is power in a child of God. There is power when the Holy Spirit dwells a child of God.